Hi, Olaf. How are you today? Uh, yeah, just I just came home from a week of vacation, so it's kind of like unpacking stuff and uh, weather is really bad the uh, last two days here, so not a lot to do. It's, I mean, we just had a thunderstorm coming through, so it's, yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. I saw your pictures. It uh, looks like a pretty nice place you went to. Yeah, it's a small island uh, almost over, but it's very close to the to the Poland border. It's normally where old people go. Uh, well, should be probably me then. <laughs> but it's, How, uh, it's, it's nice the, there. I mean, we're allowed to, you know, we like your Euro, European travel is like some people are in Spain right now. You can go there, but most of the places, restaurants and stuff are closed. That's what they're reporting. So, and you have to wear masks when you go to shops and stuff like that and into restaurants. So not a lot of people are traveling at the moment. So we felt like I went with a good friend and we felt like it's best to stay in Germany. So we rented a nice apartment with a nice swimming pool right by the the sea the weather was okay like like a good edmonton summer actually i mean not what you expect when you're in southern europe but uh, it was nice 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 okay well uh the podcast just uh since uh we've become really good friends and it's come through uh alberta handball and making a relationship with yourself and your club uh just wanted you on the podcast uh so people learn more about you i mean people know who you are here a lot of people that have traveled so wanted you to get on the podcast so first if you can give Thanks. us a, a brief a uh, little bit of history of your handball background and your involvement with coaching right now well i've been coaching i think since i was 16 or 17 my club was uh, looking for a coach for the younger teams as i think most of the people get into coaching either it's their own kids here in germany that they're coaching at a certain point or when you're a player, you're asked to coach a team. Uh, that's how I started coaching. Uh, and I had to stop my career because of a knee injury when I was 22. Uh, and I stopped playing from there and I coached more and more. And when I was 26, I found myself being U18 champion um, in Germany, um, coaching a girls U18 team of a very famous club that time. I was called Litzel Linden. The club is uh, a long time ago bankrupt. Um, not because of me, of course, um, but it's uh, the club doesn't exist anymore. But most people in Germany know it. It's called TV Lützelinden. Actually, it's quite funny. The girls from that time, from '96, when they were German champion, they still meet sometimes. We met four years ago to celebrate the 20th anniversary of being German champions, and I think like out of the 18 players, 15 were there. Uh, most, a lot of them have kids now, but it, it was a very, very fun night actually. And uh, and going forward in your career then you started coaching professionally and uh the national team well i made a i made a decision when i was finished with with college and i had my uh, i was done with with studying business and i was working at the radio station in sports at the same time that i wanted to go abroad and go somewhere else and while i was quite a good yaus coach in germany there were not a lot of offers in germany for really getting a professional job and the norwegian team was actually looking for uh, someone that that uh, was one of the two coaches uh, for the first team. The club is called Stabæk EF. They're still in the, the the highest division in Norway. So I got the chance there to work with the U16s and the U18s uh, and with the the women's team. And I took the chance and just packed packed my bags, packed my stuff in a little van, and moved to Norway. Uh, which was quite an experience, actually, because I was still a young coach at that time. And um, living in Norway is really, really expensive. I mean, you know, you've been there as well. Yeah. So um, I really liked it from a point, like from a point of the sport. But the, the funny thing, what I found in Norway is the national team is so big and everybody's saying that's paradise for women handball. And at that time, Anja Andersen was playing in the league and there was a lot of TV around the national team and around her club or around Beckelage, but there was not really a lot of attention. Like we had like 200, 250 spectators at every home game. And, and th there's so much more attention even in the second Bundesliga women here in Germany, while there's no attention in the media or for the national team, it's, it's, it's very, it was very different experience. I expected it to be a lot more. And then it's in Norway, it's, it's, very cold in the winter. I mean, Alberta people probably wouldn't care. Me as a German, I found it very dark and very cold there. So I moved on to Denmark, um, took the, the, the Danish top team, Frederikshafen EF. Um, actually, they have uh, there in their town, it's, it's right on the, the, the north 
like on the north tip of Denmark, and they have a very big handball tournament there in uh, always in Easter, the Rutzbetter Cup. It's quite quite famous. And at that time, they had a they had a very good uh, first league team there. Uh, we played European Cup there. But I decided after that I had to get away from Scandinavia and I had to move on and, and I had to get home. So I, um, in Germany, we always say I changed sports. I, I took a women's team uh, in, the, in the German at that time, it was called Regionalliga, which is the, the third league. Um, and the job was to get them into second Bundesliga, which uh, I think they've been number two or number three in the league for, I think, 10 years and never moved up. So um, we rebuilt the team. Um, we had a very young team at the time. In the second year, we made it to move up second Bundesliga. We had a big celebration. It's a very small city. It's called Bad Neustadt. We had a big celebration, 5,000 people on the marketplace to celebrate with the team. And then we had a trip sponsored uh, by the officials of the team going to EB. They're all inclusive. It was, a <laughs> it, it was fun. It was really fun. And then I, then I, then I, then I moved as well. I, I moved on to another um, after four years there. I moved on to another um, club, being the the, the managing director um, in men's handball. But that um, that that club, there were some some problems from the years before. It um, the tax authorities made a raid there from the time before, and and some people went to court. Um, so, so that possibility went down and, and meanwhile, I was offered the job to, to be the head coach of the, um, of the Dutch national women's team. So I was Dutch bonds coach. They say they're head coach of the women's national team with quite a lot of the profiles there. Um, uh, Pearl van der Wissel played there, Olga Assing, a lot of the really good players, a lot of the young players actually that are some of them that are, that have been in the last years on the national teams. They're actually played in the U19 at that time and, and made their first steps into, into the women's team. Um, quite an interesting period, but with the job together, being then the CEO of, of, of a man's team, th there was too much time involved in it. And, and um, so, um, yeah, after that, I, I had one more, I had one more um, successful year um, bringing Göppingen up in the first league to Germany. Second league, we won all the games in the playoffs and made it to the first league. And then as it is in this business, you're getting hired, you're getting fired. And, and I was kind of getting, I don't want to say I was getting sick of it, but it's like, there's not that much. I mean, there's okay money in German handball, but it's still not as you're in soccer or you're in American football or you're in baseball, you know, you, you don't get fired and you get a new job and you call your agent and you say like, Hey man, find me a house there. You know, like th that's not the kind of money you have a regular income, but, but, it, and I was getting tired of from moving around from, from one country to the other. So I've, I found myself a regular job and I started being the, the PR and event manager uh, for an American company for the North European markets. And I did it for four years. And I, in those four years, actually, I've never been in the hall. <laughs> I, I, I didn't miss Hamble. I think I saw two matches the whole time there live. I've, I didn't train anybody. And then I got by accident. Um, I ran into an old colleague uh, looking for, for a friend's daughter for, for a new club. And I ran into an old friend and I started coaching a little bit in Batschwata again and well the outcome you know the outcome better than I know the outcome so um, we've I've been doing this for 10 years now I'm in the federation here doing the being the vice president for for coaches education and for top sports I've been coaching well different ages U18 U16 over the last years I have a third league women team again to develop some of the younger players so I still have a regular job <laughs> and I have like a handball job completely on the side. So it's, I'm, I, I think my only day off from handball is Monday normally when, when the season is going on. So, um, but it's, you know, it's a passion. So what can yeah. you do? Um, before we get to where you are right now, just going back, uh, when you were coaching in all the countries and ended up in the, the Dutch national team, uh, the trend of handball, did you find it like very different? Did you bring your own uh, philosophies to Norway and into Denmark? Or did you really try to buy into their, their philosophy of handball or is it even different? Well, you, you know, you try to bring something to every team. I think they hire you when they hire a young German in Norway, they don't expect you to do it completely the Norwegian way. They, they try to bring something in there and we, no, normally in Norway they play they play a lot of six zero defense and we tried that year to establish a three to one defense on the side, 
Um, for some people, it works very well. I mean, when I was a young coach, I tried to put more of my own handwriting when I came somewhere because I felt that it was the job I was hired for. Nowadays, I think I wouldn't do that again. But then you start, of course, learning from the different different influences that are in those countries. Like I learned a lot in Norway. I had I had a guy like Otto Thier Peterson. He was um, he was the the another coach for the U18 and U16. He worked together with me, and he he was at that time I think 25 years older than me and he has been German uh, Norwegian national coach uh, he has been through a lot I mean he has developed a lot of players so those, so there were a lot of influences and we had a lot of discussions about how to do things and and I learned quite a lot of from these people I mean it's 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 I I had the honor of of uh, meeting Winko Kandir. He was in in practice camp with Lutz Linden, and and I had uh, two weeks with him where I could ask him all the questions as a young coach I wanted him to ask. So you learn from these people, and you you learn from their experience, and sometimes you learn what not to do, what they do, and sometimes you learn really something where you say like, wow, this is great. And then there are these different playing styles, and you 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 see that the Danish at that time were playing so different from what the Norwegians were doing and from what we learned in Germany and how we were doing things in Germany. And then you start kind of building your own idea about what you think is ideal. And it helps you a little bit to look at each individual player and to see at that player and say like, okay, what, from what I know about handball and the different styles, what would fit that player the most? Like, like in, in, in Norway, the auto Theo Peters always had the question, like, what is the, what is the top strength of that one player? You know, what, what can she or he do so good that, that she would be an outstanding world-class player? I mean, we had Caroline dure Breivang, which, um, was a uh, World Cup winner, gold medal winner for Norway, European champion, Champions League winner with Lavik. She had all the four titles at the same time. I think she's the only professional in handball that ever had all these four t- titles at the same time. And, and she, she had no jump shot. And when I saw her when she was 17, I had a big discussion with, with Otto about like, man, we got to teach her proper jump shot. You know, she could be so good. And I said like, no, no, she has this, she has this very good, shot staying on the ground she's a very good defender she's a very good pivot player as well she can go very good in one-on-ones we don't need to teach her hop like like she has so many good strengths let's develop those strengths and make them perfect and don't try to make her good in everything that you you know we don't try to keep teach her goalkeeping you know and and i was like at that time i was like i was standing there i was 29 i was like wow that's smart man maybe he's right um Probably I didn't say that the first time he said it to me. But, but, but that's so, funny so, that you say that because uh, I learned that from you. Because uh, a lot of times when I come and I work with your team and you work with my team and you, you preach that a lot, they don't need to be great at 12 different things. They need to be great at one. Yeah, it helps to have a second and a third yeah. thing, but yeah. but 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 like the, the, this this one thing in Norway they say Spitzfertighead, like your top thing. Really try to be good in your top thing. I mean, a lot of players in Germany play in the first league, or even a lot of players in the Champions League play because they are really good at one thing or at two things. And and you, but you have to be extremely good at that. And and the question is always where do you invest the time you know like 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 i mean i think if you look through all sports i mean like like is cam newton great from the pocket he's okay from the pocket but he's very good running the football as a quarterback probably maybe the best look at tom brady is he good in running the football no what was his career rushing so far 1000 yards so i mean like is somebody trying to make tom brady a rushing quarterback wouldn't be so smart you know so so the question is always like like how much better do you make a person on something that they're probably not even made for but but what is the ability how can they tribute tribute something to to bring something to your team that makes them very successful or to their career or to a national team it was actually quite funny then in 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 holland all these players at that time were not playing in holland there was not one single player on that national team from the established player that was playing in Holland. They were spread out all over the world. They were playing in, in Spain, I think two players at that time, uh, a lot of them in Norway, a lot of them in Denmark, some in Germany. 
Um, and it was so funny to see that they all had these different, they, they had this Dutch general approach of playing very fast technical handball, but then they all had this little twist of their, of their home club cultures to it, um, which, which, which was very, very interesting to see how, how you can bring that together on a team. Now, going into the Dutch national team, uh, you, you were with the group before the big, uh, the big uh, Dutch push for women's handball? Or- well, the, the first push was right before. Um, they had, a, they had a, a big program and they wanted to go to the Olympics. And uh, Brad Brower, a uh, guy from Holland, was behind that. And he was the, the, the national coach for a long time. And they got quite a lot of money from the, from the Olympic Committee in, in Holland to make it to the Olympics. And they, they, but they never made it. And, and they had the philosophy of keeping the players in Holland and trying to make them like make a Netherlands team and be in the European Cup. But that never really worked out. So, so half a year before I came in, they hired a Norwegian coach, but she just did it for half a year. And actually, I came in when they failed their big success um, of going to the Olympics. And then we had a kind of year, year and a half years where we tried to rebuild it. We brought a lot of younger players in. We made the team a lot younger. And, and that was right before, like, like the guy after me, Shorsh Ratkas, he went with them one year after. Um, he was my assistant coach. He went with them to the, to the, um, to the I think, I don't know where that seven, was. Uh, world it was in world, yeah, they came fourth in, on the world championships in Russia. Russia? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, actually it was, a, it was like we won the Lucardi Cup um, quite, yeah, I think a month before I stopped with the youngest Dutch team that there was ever out there. Um, so we kind of were in that transaction period where this new generation came in. Um, it's, it's I, I think they had the dream before, but they actually before like a year, one and a half years, I can't remember that. They, they started spreading the players around in Europe and gave them the advice, like go find top clubs, which they've never did before. And it started to pay out in the time when I was there as a coach. Okay. And now moving forward uh, with your club, Bad Toronto, um, when you started with them, what, where were they in divisions? What kind of level was it at? Well, we, they, they had a, they had a U18 team in the highest division here, which was regional at that time, like always being in between like somewhere seat number six, seven. And we started with a U14 team, which was not even in the highest league. And we tried to qualify them. I did it together with Volker, a friend of mine. Um, and we qualified for the highest league. And I think we came fourth there and, and then it built it from there that, that like we had this small group and they went pretty far. Like it was the 96 group and together with some 95s that came from outside, they were there in the first year when the U18 Bundesliga was founded and they qualified for it. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, we won, I think three games in that qualification by one goal. Um, so it was, but we were there in the first year of U18 Bundesliga. And so you can see, a lot of these players put in a lot of work when they were U14, they were not really good. And like, no one was considering them really to be that great handball talents, but they put a lot of work in and four years later, they could make it in the highest new founded league in Germany among the best 24 teams in Germany. Uh, I think we even made the main round in that year. Yeah. I think we made the main round. So we were on the last 16 in Germany. Um, and from there, it was actually quite funny because more and more players joined and the, the, the push through the group in the club, like the younger players, all of a sudden when they were 10 years old or so, they, they got the idea of, oh, that's Bundesliga, that's real cool. There are 200 people at the games. I want to play there one day. So, so, the, so the kids started working differently and we got then, we were quite lucky. We were all all of our coaches are not professionals. They all have jobs like Volker, which is, was a U14 coach with me at that time. He's now the goalkeeper coach. Um, and and he, he's been the goalkeeper coach for eight years, but he's a, he's a professional doctor. Um, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's running, he's running his own life aside of handball, but two times a week he's going in the hall and, and he's, he's working with the goalkeepers. And uh, we got Ines in. She's taking care of the, the U14, basically because her daughter Judith came to our club. Um, and then I was like, but you're a good coach. Like, you 
doing a good job there with some boys in your neighborhood. Why don't you join the program? And so from there on, she's been doing the U14s and the U12s. And we have a lot of other coach. We have Niels, who is a very good athletic coach. And, and so we, we brought more and more coaches in because like we all have jobs. So we, we don't have like, even I, if I'm traveling with work, I don't have the time to be in the hall in that week. So, so someone else has to do the job and, and, and it, it built it up from basically from nothing to that. We are, we are quite good for, we're not getting players to our club from far away. Like our range is like, I think the farthest drive is an hour for a player like in the, in, in the neighborhood. So there are other clubs or a lot of other clubs in Germany that have schools where you can go to school and the, the girls move from Southern Germany to books to who to, to play there and, and, be one day a professional. We don't have these players. We're working with the players from the neighborhood or from the region here. And I think we're doing quite okay for that. So one of the big philosophies you, you have, and I've talked to you this about, about many times, is that you really want to develop the youth players to be able to go to other clubs eventually to get to the top divisions. Yeah, we're not, I mean, we don't have anything like Bad Schwartau has a has a is a second Bundesliga men's club. So they also have a, a boys program and there of course they are very interested in developing players to play in their own second Bundesliga team. Our win like the club made a decision seven or eight years ago that we cannot have women's and men's handball on a top level from a pure economic side. At the same time, we are allowed to run our program as we like but we have no interest in our own players and if you look at the region here we have a university in Lübeck but you can only study medicine there and if you're a medical student you don't have the time to play handball on a high level so basically everybody has to go abroad if you want to have a successful career on the women's side and we try to our main goal is that we develop the kids that really want to make it to Bundesliga one day or second Bundesliga, that they get an education where they can achieve those goals and they don't have to move away from here before they finish with high school. So they can stay with their, their parents and they don't have to go somewhere crazy abroad, like four hours away from home when they're 14 or 15 years old. Of course, they can do that if they want that, but we give them a chance. Like if you're from Batschwata or if you're from the Lübeck area, and you want to make second or first Bundesliga, we have enough players in the last years that have proven that, that, that the way we educate them, they can play on that level. So, um, yeah, the philosophy is to give the kids from the area the opportunity to one day be great in their sports without leaving home too early. That's basically how you could break it down. So you have a few girls from this, pro this year's program that are leaving? Yeah, we have um, Angie, our playmaker. She's going to Norway. I mean, they are. the school is finished now when you still have one year in U18. Or for a lot of them, they, have still, they could still play one year in U18, but they're finished with school, so they move. So Angie is going, our playmaker, she's going to, um, to Norway. Um, she's joining Volda, which is a, a first division, second league Norwegian women's team. Uh, she's very excited to go there. I mean, it's... Norway, <laughs> the, the, the country of women's handball. And uh, Judith, uh, our right wing, she's going to, um, she's going down South Germany in Weibling, and that's the second Bundesliga women's team. Uh, very good coach down there, Thomas, uh, very good in developing young players. So we see how it goes for her there. Of course, for both of them, a big step going, you know, leaving home, leaving, leaving your parents, leaving all your friends and, uh, um, and, and seeing like if, you, if you can compete with the big women. The others are staying, like all the others are staying with us for the moment or most of them uh, to join other teams. But the, but the most of our top players are staying and, and trying to develop and play another great year in third league women with, with Alstertal together where we cooperate with. And uh, we hope to have a season here where we can show that we are as good as we were last year. And uh, you had some great results going into last year or last year going into COVID, uh, where were you guys at in the Bundesliga for U18? Can, can we not talk about, can we not no, open no, that you don't again? Talk about no, it. no, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> we were in the, we were in the quarterfinals with the U18 uh, team. We had to meet Oldenburg, which uh, 
yeah, it, it always has to be played, but I think there was a 50 a good chance that we could maybe make the final four. And our U16s were undefeated at the time. Uh, they were already champions up here in their division, and they would have gone to the, uh, to the round of the last 16 for German championships. And they met a lot of good teams that year, and uh, most of them, uh, they, they won most of the games, so they were one of the favorites also to go to a final four, maybe to win a German championship. We never know. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's kids' handball. It can go really crazy. You have one, two injuries, or they, you know, they're not mentally prepared for one of the big games, and then you're out. But from a pure point of what they could play, what they could do on the field, how they played in tournaments, how they played in the top games against Buxtehude or against Handewitt, it looked pretty good. That's good. Uh, going back, I think about five, six years when we met. So I contacted uh, someone in Germany about uh, taking our youth uh, development program to Germany. And I think he contacted you. Yeah, he asked for it. He was looking for games in our yeah. area. I think so you, you, then you contacted me and kind of asked, like, don't think you knew much about Canada handball at that time. Um, and so uh, we kind of talked and you helped us set up a, a many games in your region. Um, obviously, we take players there that are just, you know, playing handball for three, four months. Um, going into the first year and you saw our players, uh, obviously you didn't know. And what were your expectations of Canada handball? And then when you saw us, what do you think of, obviously we had no level, it's all beginners, but your expectations and what you saw, what do you think? Well, first of all, and that's like the guy that contacted me made it pretty clear. These guys are coming and they are beginners and they're not yeah. on that high level. And then you, you know, then you try to find a little bit more out, like how good are they? And because you, of course, you want to play some of the good teams and have an experience what it feels yeah. like, what the other teams in that other country can do. But on the same side, you want to have some competition as well. And so it was really like first year was really hard to find like to have any idea of whom you yeah. could play. And then on the other hand, when you have someone like nobody knows here at that time up here in the North, nobody knew who's team Alberta. So you're calling people and it's in the middle of the holidays and you know, everybody's vacationing and you're like, like guys, I need, I need you to show up. Yeah, but I only have eight players. Yeah. Eight will be good enough probably to beat them. <laughs> oh no, I don't want my team to look bad. I guess, can you please show up? You know, like, and, and then, then the reaction of the people is so funny because because some play national anthems and, you know, get a, get a speaker to announce the names and like really make something crazy out of it. And yeah. some others don't even find a good referee. You know, it's, yeah. it's just like, it's like, I think it was funny over the years. Like, and now, nowadays you, I put a post up on Facebook, Alberta's coming again, who wants to play? And the people start calling you, you know, and, and, and it's more a question of with how many teams are you coming and how many teams does the other club have? And does it fit the schedule? So in the beginning it was really like hard work, like convincing people to, to play this team Alberta, you know, yeah. and, and now it's, well, you, you made yourself a name up here being the nice Canadian, always saying, thank you, you know, bringing, yeah. <laughs> bringing a lot of sweaters and t-shirts and, you know, p people like playing you. Um, and, what the, in, over the years, I think it's been five, six years we've gone with our development. Have you seen um, a development in our program, like better athletes, uh, I mean, some years you have better players, obviously, than other. But have you seen a development in our program? I would say that the overall, I mean, you could see that you have more players that bring already a certain level. I mean, I think that your high school program is kicking in a little bit there. Um, in the beginning, it was like there were two, three, where you said like, okay, this could be a so-so player and now sometimes but maybe the, the impression is wrong because you're coming now also with the better teams when they're older and you know they're playing for a longer time so for me personally it's really harder to judge like like where are certain teams at i mean last summer remember that one team you had with you yeah. and they like they hardly scored a goal they didn't want to play yeah yeah, they didn't want to play. So yeah. so I think it's always up from, from year to year to the players. But but I think in general, I mean, there was already our – like I remember the first year and I was like, okay, they don't have handball skills, but a lot of your players had some athletic or movement skills where you could see that they were either volleyball players or basketball players. Yeah. And the style, even for our players, it was like even our players were so much better. They were like like – 
I never seen a move like that. Like, what did she just do? You know, like how, how did she get past me on that move? Of, of course she didn't score because the shooting was poor, but like, how did she get, like, how, what, what did she just do? And I was like, yeah, well, they, that was a basketball move. You can try it as well. So it, it's always, it's always fun to see them coming in from different sports while we are, and I think that's the main difference. You know, here you start when you want to be really good in playing handball, you kind of start like when you're nine years old or something. And most of them don't do other, a lot of other sports. And then the question is, is their coach somehow a little bit more focused on doing the athletic works while, while your kids are automatically in a high school program where they do basketball and they do volleyball and they do athletics. And so, so, so your general physical skills and your general ball handling skills i would say they are better than than, than our players yeah. but we are so much more hand like we have so much more handball movement in us and so much more tactical skills that you develop through all the games that you had on a certain level that that there there's the big gap but you see that when you start playing teams that are not that good in Germany, I mean, your teams, once they have trained for one, two years, you're having a lot of success. Yeah, yeah. Um, a big thing I've lot of, uh, learned a lot from you as a coach uh, throughout the years, looking at our programs and even in Canada Handball, what are you think are the big objectives for us to work with when we get those players in junior high school or high school that come from other sports? What do you think are the most important things to teach them well i i mean the, the, the game is all about passing and catching right i mean yeah. it, like have a proper shot have a proper pass is what i would say is 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 the thing for everybody that plays handball if you can't like it doesn't help you if you can jump two meters high if you can't throw the ball it's it, it always comes down to passing and throwing at the end of the day um but i think you know, you're getting now more and more kids. Like you're very successful in Alberta with, with spreading the sport out and having more people playing in, in high schools. And that will automatically bring up your, your competition and it will automatically bring up the level of players because you just have a bigger base of players to pick from. And it, uh, I'm very sure that, that when you started, you were so much, you had to rely on those two, three good players that they don't stop or that they want to train. And I think nowadays, I, I see more and more, like, it's just more players that are on a certain level coming over. And you're having just more players. And then the one that will train more will automatically develop. And and you're trying, you're making a good job on trying to make your coaches better. I feel that you have a lot of curious coaches, maybe not enough, but the people yeah. are curious to learn more about the game. And a lot of the other stuff comes with experience. And it's... um. Um, actually, I had a coach in my career when I was a younger player, and he was he was a tennis coach. I mean, he was not even a handball coach, but he just was pre he was just saying like catch the ball properly, throw it properly. He was just he was just teaching fundamentals all the time, and he was actually quite a good handball coach. I mean, I learned a lot from him by just by just his attitude towards sports in general, his attitude towards the game, and just by repeating basic drills all the time. I mean, his his, his practice was boring at a time, but yeah. If I look at my practice nowadays, I don't feel like I'm, it's not that much different. I mean, we don't, you, you know our practice. We don't do hocus pocus. We don't invent ourselves new every day. It's basically the same drills over and over and over again. And I mean, you know, our players are getting confused if you are running some of your drills they've never seen before. And they are like, what the hell is he asking? Throw the ball there, <laughs> run there. Why, why? Like, and they look like, they, they look like stupid little kids when you do it with them. You know, yeah. well, they're good handball players. It's just they don't know the drill, you know? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, the the big difference is because what I find is that here you have to make the practice because my belief is when we get a player in the gym, you have to make them fall in love with the sport. And so, you have, like you said, if we're repetitive on the same basic drill over and over and over again, our players, they don't last. While there, it's, they, they would live and die for handball a perfect example is sometimes when we're there we practice at 10 in the morning some of the girls from your club come and join our practices here or there then they don't practice till six o'clock they sit in the gym from 12 to 6 they'll eat lunch they'll practice their spin shots they'll hang out with their friends they'll work on different things it's such a different culture yeah but 
I mean, is the love for the game being more because you, because you make practice more fun? I mean, like our players just love shooting and shooting and running with the ball. Yeah. You know, it's it's like like if you make the, if you make practice too much, they, like they just love what they do. They just love yeah. shooting the ball. Like they hang out after practice because they just love taking another twenty shots to make their shots better. It, yeah. And I don't think you can. I'm not sure if you can really change that by making practice more. Like, you know, like getting a new exercise in every day. And you got to explain them. If you want to be good, you need your repetitions. Yeah, yeah. But of course, that, that those repetitions have to be kind of fun. The, yeah. the worst thing what you can do is do some drills where a player has one shot in 10 minutes. Yeah. And the exactly. player is just standing around there. Yeah, but, yeah. but in general, they love doing the same stuff over and over again. It, it's like we just had, you know, after COVID and we had like, I think we didn't practice for two months, three, three months without any body contact and then body contact and small groups were allowed. So we did four, four and four up the court, four and four the way back, like with competition points and stuff like that. I mean, that was, they were more thrilled like, like in a Champions League game probably under normal circumstances just because they were like, oh my God, we can touch again. We can play for points. Like there was so much cheering and celebrating right. after, after like batting down a ball that would have led to a point for the other team. Just because because they just love being competitive and just running around, throwing a ball and running on the court. It's, yeah. it's, it, I don't think that, I mean, of, of course you are competing with a lot of different sports, but we are doing that here as well. Yeah. I think the point on it is, is, is if the players love the sport and love the physicality of the sport and the contact and the body contact and, and all that comes with it, then, then they will just love to get better and get, be more competitive. And they just love practice where, where it's, you know, we always talk about that, that on a practice level, it has to be motivating, of course, but you have to get your repetitions in and you, you also got to, you, you know, you have to keep the player going and the player has to, to get repetitions and good corrections. And it has to be like, like easy things like left side shoots against right side, who has first 10 goals, stuff like that, you know, like, like be competitive, have goals in practice. And, and as said, if the kids are not standing around, if you move them in the hall, they just love it. And as yeah. you said, like, yeah, but I mean, I had a player, she was, she was in the hall like two hours before practice as that I, like, what are you doing here? Don't you have a home? And she said, you know, it's my home. It's the hall. So, you know, <laughs> I, I think you love the sport or you don't love the sport. Yeah. I just think, uh, I agree with everything. It just, we, we battle because when handball, when you hit 19, 20, you can't go to university with it. So our thing is about, you know, like making sure that we can take the players from different sports where they have that future. They can look at the university of Alberta. Oh, I can go play basketball, volleyball, football. And we gotta, we gotta put in that, Hey, we can send you to Academy. So I just find it uh, a little bit different, just getting the players and the parents really invested in the sport and the money that they have to put out to play. So, yeah, well, it's, it's, I mean, look, I, I think if I would have asked you seven years ago, are you going to have a high school league yeah. in Alberta? You would have probably said like, Oh no, that's never going to happen. And now look, you have an established high school league yeah. going quite well in Alberta. Yeah. Maybe the colleges follow one day and, yeah. and yeah. They, they, there's going to be a competition for that. And then, then maybe there might be scholarships out one day. I'm very sure you're working or you're trying to work on it, but you can be very sure the more players you have coming out of high school asking the university, like, why don't you have handball? Yeah. It, it might happen one day, but it's, a, but of course it's a long way. You know, it's, it's, we've seen it here over here with baseball. We've seen it here with American football. There was a, there was a time when baseball was, we, we had a period when we had quite some clubs here where people played baseball and it was like, it was a peak and was going up and, but it kind of never made it real through. So it kind of vanished again a little bit. It went down. We had a peak for American football, like two, three years, but then people found out, Oh my God, you have, you need to have 60 people at least, or at least 35, you know, to, to, to have an offense and a defense to play. And, you know, nowadays people don't, 
don't care so much. They go like, oh my God, I got to go three times a week and that and that time, you know, they, oh, I'd rather go to the gym whenever I want. So it's hard for them to keep these rosters filled up. But there was a, like, like with the popularity and, and NFL promoting the sport over here, I mean, yeah. football work, but it, but it never got that popular. So the question is, of course, I mean, will there, will there be, will there be a line? Why, is, why was Quebec good before you guys came up? Because they had that Olympic thing. When was that in, in Montreal? 76. 76. You know, the, yeah. what, what you see in Quebec now is still left over of 76, kind of. And the, the, the French heritage over there. But, yeah. but it, it never gave that super big push. I mean, maybe now the U.S. is... I heard this one U.S. keeper is going from Force League in Germany now to uh, a guy... 21 years old and he's so, going to champions league in elverum in norway so he's um he's he he just has an american passport oh okay so he, but like, still i mean yeah but come on still he's going from force league in yeah. germany to elverum and he talked something i heard an interview where he said like yeah ihf is trying these programs and to make handball big for the next olympics so i mean if they really invest there it 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 could happen that, I mean, it, it would be a sport that the Americans would be interested in because it's fast and it's contact and stuff like that. The question is always how serious are these efforts? I mean, it was the same in, in a friend of mine that was with me in Starbucks. She coached the, the women's national team. Victor Holmes said she coached the women's national team in the UK for the Olympics there. And they even had one of the Queen's family saying like, oh my God, that sport, if I would have that in high school, I would have done, I love it. And there was a big splash in the newspaper. And after the Olympics, it was all gone. So, you know, it's, it's, it's I think um, what you're doing right now with, with, with being in the high schools, having a league there, like getting more and more people involved, I think yeah. it's more solid fundament than having a splash for one Olympic. Yeah. But I well, I think like our big thing is we're getting younger. Like we've started junior high school leagues, which is like seven to nine. Uh, you know, we're really putting a lot of investment into clubs, pushing clubs to really then go back to the schools to work with the schools to build the clubs. Um, so, the, I mean, those are our goals to tr keep on developing. But like you said, it's it's the development of coaches. It's the development of referees. It just, uh, the culture still is, is the tougher thing because you need people to coach those teams and you know, we're building, building, but like you say, it's going to take years because we got to get those people that have played that have culture that want to give back to be able to continue to grow the sport. So I just think you just continue to do what we do, but it takes time. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Um, talking about that American player. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the European handball federation, someone in it, they started a, a, a site called form handball. And European, they, ha they have money in there. And you, clubs get money to have Americans on the team. Oh, okay. It's called formhandball.com. Yeah, but, that, but that's what he mentioned. That, that's probably yeah. the, either yeah. EHF or, or, or IHF, whoever did it. Yeah. That's what he said that there is. So obviously, Elverum needed the money and said like, oh, we yeah. can bring a second goalkeeper in, which is quite nice. Which, yeah, yeah it, it might help. I mean... Uh, at the end of the day, if these guys can't compete, if these girls can't compete, they will be not. They they won't be long on the team. Maybe they will just carry. Like, but still, the question is, for for him, instead of playing force league in Germany, like being in practice at least with a Champions League team. I mean, it helps you to develop if you really work on it. I mean, it could be too much for him, but it could also be a big push for him. You you never know that. Uh, going forward, I mean. Uh... You've watched a little bit, and you, you and I have talked about our uh, our national teams. Uh, do you think our national team can be successful with players staying in Canada, or do you think that we need to be able to send our players overseas? Well, I think that this is pretty much the the Netherland Holland example. If you don't have a good league at home, if you don't have good competition, you will never be as good as. I mean, look, look what the Brazilian, where are all the Brazilians at the moment? I mean, are they playing in Brazil? Not a lot of them anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, think, I think you need to have these players in good environments and good leagues, um, and they will just learn from the daily games. Um, and the more you have outside, probably if they come home, if they still find time to play at home, 
I think they can be good. It's it's a question of of getting this experience in. And I mean, as said, the Dutch had a good they had good teams when the like like in that time, I think ninety eight or ninety nine, they had really good teams, and then they 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 put them together in a club in in Holland, and they even played in the European in the European leagues with them. But that wasn't enough, so they needed to have the the, the the weekly competition on a high level, and I think the more players you bring abroad, the more players you will get back. That that that, and of course it's a, of course it's an an investment. On the other hand, if you go to Europe, <laughs> you can say it's a good or it's a bad thing. But but you cannot go to England because there is no handball. So if you go, no matter if you go to Germany, Norway, Denmark, Spain. France, you have to learn another language and you have to speak another language. And it's a complete, like, it will help you in your life. Like if you speak another European language fluent, I'm very sure you will always find a sales job in Canada for that market. So, so if you do that, if you go abroad, it's not only for the handball, but it's for the cultural experience. It's for the language. Um, But my biggest advice from experience, learn the language, learn it fast and better learn some words before you go. That's funny because we had a podcast with Brent McDougall. And she was taking Swedish classes in university and she got there and she say, she said, that's the one thing I, I, I go back and she's like, I learned it, but I needed to do it more. She's like, that was a big thing. Uh, all the players always try to help you out, but you also always feel like you're not getting everything you can if you don't know the language. Well, the funniest thing is in Sweden, they all speak very good English. I mean, yeah. it's not a problem to communicate with any, like even, like even in a supermarket store. I mean, try the same in France, you know, like, like yeah. you're lost, you know, or try the same in Spain. When you're not in the tourist places, you, you're lost. Like you will not even order a burger and a beer properly uh, if you don't speak the language. That's interesting. A uh, few uh, last questions. Um, Starting with youth in, say, with uh, Alberta team handball, or when you start with the younger age categories, uh, defensively, are you a big believer of teaching 6 0 first or teaching open defenses to work on footwork? It doesn't matter too much. No, <laughs> you don't uh, think so? Oh, you know, it's there's a big discussion about this, and I don't want to I don't want to go too much into it. Yeah. In Germany, we have to play open open court um, one one defenses when they're younger. In Denmark and in Iceland, they're going the absolute different way. The reason is is they want to have every like the Danish say we want to have every body in defense inside nine meter, so everybody can learn to pass the ball and everybody can learn to touch the ball. So who's better in Who's better in handball, Denmark or Germany? Like you, obviously both ways work, you know? Like yeah. it's, it's, it's not that it's this one way. The point is here, I would say that you have to go one way and you have to, you have to either make it a philosophy like the Danes that say, I want to have my players a proper, a proper shot when they are already 14 years old. And you can see it in the shooting technique against six zero. They are a lot ahead of us when they are 13, 14 years old. Well, we are a lot ahead when we're taking space. So it's, it's a very, very tricky question and there is no this answer or that answer on it. It's, um, it's the question. Do you want to have more, you want to follow more an offensive way of, of saying like every kid is allowed to touch the ball or you want to have more the way of learn to steal the ball, learn to defend in space. It's, I would say, I'm not, not sure, but all these South American teams you're meeting, right? They play pretty offensive defensive and this will be in the long run, always be the teams you got to play. So I think you got to learn more to attack in space. So probably it would help you if you go more offensively in the younger ages in in defense. That that would be my take. And for like, uh, as you know, kind of the athletic abilities of our players, younger kids that are wanting to play overseas, uh, the main thing you think is working on their individual technical skills is the most important thing? Yes. That's for sure. And I mean, they, they need to put in the time. I mean, when they come here, they should be able to run well, to lift well. Um, they, they, I, I, I think like all the high schools over there in Canada have, or most of them have the possibilities to, to put proper time in your athletic yeah. training. There's always a teacher that can help you with that. And that's purely you 
coming in good shape. And if you're coming in good shape, everybody's already a little bit like, oh, at least she can run, you know, or at least he can run, you know, oh, he can lift. Oh, interesting. At least he's putting in the work. Um, that that nobody is expecting your players to come with the perfect tactical culture and 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 with but but you know a good shot um attacking space and being in in good individual shape i think it will already make it will always be a question where you go as well you know what's the philosophy there and who are the coaches and you have also to to find the right spot for young players of course but i would say put in work if you love your sport you will always succeed sooner or later. The question is, will you achieve all your goals? But you will at least achieve some of them if you really put in the work. If you don't put in the work, you will not. So as a club, you're running a club in Germany. When you look for players, you, you look for more of a player that's more defined in individual skills, and then you could really teach the rest? We Look, first of all, we are looking mostly for players that want to put in the work here. Like a lot of kids join us when they are when they're 12, 13, 14, normally they don't come in a lot later than when they're 15 years old. Yeah. And, and, and we, what we learned is that the ones, they were more talented ones, but if they don't want to work, hard work always beats talent, not on the first day, but, but you need to have the repetitions. You need to have a work ethic. You, you, I mean, it's the same, like talk to a college basketball coach, talk to, Bill Belichick, you know, they will always say the same thing. The question is always, does the athlete believe it? Or, you know, we're, we're in the same level of sports. It's very physical, but you also need to have a, a sound fundamental technique. You know, you, you, you need to know what, what to do, where to put your foot, how to move your arm and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, and we're trying to, we want players that want to work with it. And, and that's it because because we're always telling them like, it's not your fault that nobody has ever told you that and that before, but we will, yeah. we will teach you. We will tell you just put in the work and try to do it and you will be successful. And most of them that put in the work have been more successful than they thought they could ever be in their life. Yeah. Um, if you talk to the players now, if you, if you look at Angie, who's now going to Norway, she was, when she came into the U16, she was on the second team for the first, for, for her first tournament on U16, she was on our second team. And now it's three years later and she's going to, to Norway to be a pro player there. So, yeah. so that's her work. It's not, it was never like, she was very talented in moving, but she was not the super overall talent tall and could do everything. She had to learn it. She had to earn it. And I think everybody that wants to earn it can earn it. Uh, last few questions is, uh, do you still have a lot of goals left in handball or is it more now just because the love for the sport or would you like to coach professionally again? Uh, that's, it's always tempting, you know, when you see, yeah. when you see a game and you, 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 you know, there's a crowd and you know the feeling to it that, that you, or when you have one of these tournaments where we, when we, when we, we won Rutz Better Cup with, in this great hall there, up there in Frederickshafen three times with the U18 and playing a final there is, that's fun, you know, or playing, we have another big tournament in Germany uh, for girls 18. You've been there as well, uh, Sauerland Cup, you know, great hall, 1,400 spectators always sold out. I yeah. think we played the finals there for the last I don't know, four or five years, and we always won it with a U16, U18. That's great. It's fun. And then you're sometimes thinking, oh, I could do that every day. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I like the way it is right now in my life. Um, I have a job uh, I do now for 10 years. Um, I like, well, when it's not COVID, I like flying around the world <laughs> and talking to my customers and being on trade fairs. And on the other hand, I like that I'm not a professional handball coach and I can do whatever I want, you know, whenever you're getting paid for being a handball coach, there will always be a manager or there will always be a sportive director or there will always be the father that's the main sponsor and his daughter plays on the team. And there will always be some trouble about what you do and why do you do that. And, and I have quite a nice life right now in Batshvato because, well, if you don't want me, I I go running and uh, I leave the club and it's, it's, it's they, they let me do what I want to do. Our, our, our coaching team, we have a very strong culture in doing what we believe in. And we have a very strong culture in not listening too much to, to outside people. And, 
if you're a paid coach, I always have the feeling that there is a lot of outside influence. If it's the press, if it's the sponsors, if it's, and I don't know if I would like that in my life. You know, I'm getting now my paycheck for, for making my goals of, of, of uh, that I, my boss gives me goals. I make my goals. I do that for 10 years. I'm still in the job. Obviously, I do this nice. As a coach, you do a tremendous job Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then your top player has a bad day on Saturday. You lose by one goal, and the press says, oh, my God, it's such a bad coach. Why didn't he do that and that? And you're like, I did my work. This, I, I put in my work the last five days. I, I don't know what you did, but I watched video. I clipped videos. I, and, and sometimes it, it makes you as nice as it is when you're successful, as bad does it get when you're unsuccessful? And it's always, I always find it goes as a coach. It always goes in these waves, you know, like you're, you're first in second Bundesliga. They celebrate with you. And of course you have the still team or, or the same team or just some new players. And next year you're in a higher league and it will not get that good. But the people are used to winning and they were like, Oh my God, what's the coach doing? Why are we so bad all of a sudden? No, we're not bad. We're in a higher league, but they don't get that. You know, fans are, you know, more about bandwagon fans over there overseas than, than we know here. And then people get angry at you and it's, I don't know. It's just, it's, I don't think that I'm going to coach professional again. There, there should happen a lot to do that. So there should be a very interesting call from a very interesting federation or, 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 or club or yeah. whatever. And uh, you, you're part of the uh, developing of coaches in your region. Yes. And uh, what are exactly, what are you working with the coaches? Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm now for, I think, nine, nine years uh, vice president um, in the federation for that. That's like, like, I'm not, like, I'm responsible from a board point of view. So I'm responsible for the top sports where we're spending the money um, for, our, for our regional teams, um, sending them to, to development programs. And then, then they get selected by the national coaches or not um, but we're presenting those players when they're younger it normally starts when they are 13 years old and it ends when they're 16 um, and I'm kind of like yeah I'm the board member supervising all that we have coaches for that and stuff like that but sometimes um, we had the situation now twice that some of one of the coaches was sick and I was like taking those teams for half a year and, and, and helping out there and on the other hand we're, we're doing like we have all the coaching development up to B level, like the German Federation has the A level courses, which is the highest. And we have the B and C level courses in our regional federation in Schleswig-Holstein. And we're doing all that coaching education. I used to run more courses than I do. Um, but it's, I have the belief that the people are, I have the belief that the people are running a little bit tired of hearing the same guys talking to you about the philosophies over and over again. Yeah. But I've been actually three, four years ago, I, I've been probably two weeks a year in the hall, in the classroom, trying to educate other coaches. But I do this now, I would say maybe two, three days a year when, when nobody else has time or, or when I want to meet some people and hear about what they think and what they should do. We have very professional people doing this for us now. Um, we've, we've done a lot. It changed a lot. When I joined the Federation nine years ago, this was, there was no one professionally do in the coaching education. And now we are running three C-level courses um, a year and one B-level courses, which is like around about 70 to 90 people in C-level and 20, 25 people in B-level every year. And, yeah. and we have someone hired for that that does it professionally. And uh, we have some other people that work voluntarily around it. And uh, we have a lot of great coaches that share their knowledge. And we, we just try to have a big, coaching team and, and have a lot of different opinions because every coach has a different philosophy. And of course we're teaching the philosophy of the German Federation, yeah. but of course every coach brings a little different twist and a little, little different topic to it. And so the, you have to have level C to coach certain age categories and then B and then yes. A for different. Yes. And yes. how you long need... does it take to get a level C, a level B? Like if... what's the progress? Yeah, if you would if you would now ask to get a level C 
coaching course. You could come in without any knowledge. The first thing we're offering is a weekend. It's called Kids Handball Education. That's like basically we offer that, like you have to do it if you want to have get this. It's part of the C-level education, but you can do it also without running the whole C-level thing. So it's basically for parents or for 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 people that coach eight, nine, ten year, eleven year old, and that have no higher leagues teams. And then when you have a team in the higher leagues, like in the higher U sixteen, U fourteen, U eighteen leagues, you need to have C level okay. education. And that's basically that that first kids coach with a weekend, and then it's uh, two times four days where. Um, you get together and at the end you have to do a demonstration course. You like you you get like you have to write a test, which is theoretically, yeah. and you but you also have to come up with 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 uh, with one practice where you get a team, you get a topic, you get a team, and you got to work it out and you got to show it and you got to show your skills. Okay. Um, and but most of the people make it. It's it's um, um, I won't say no. No, we're not generous, but it's it's a very basic education, and and we're teaching a lot about like how to use things, like how to use space on the course. You know, like like if you're two on two, is that a good space or is that is is that a good space? You know, for for the attacker, or is it better for the defender to have it smaller? Stuff like that. What to use? You know, like like what are different? We we ba we basically go through everything from shots to one one to basic defense, all that stuff. And then you go on to level B, and what would level yeah. B? Yeah, and then level B is a, a seven-day course, um, a lot higher, different topics, of course. Um, uh, it's uh, you need B level if you're in the in third league women, for example. You you need to have uh, you need to have B level, um, and you also need to have it if you want to go to A level one day. Okay. And lay, A level is for coaching Bundesliga. First yes. Bundesliga? Yes. I think second Bundesliga, you still can still coach with B level, second Bundesliga women, yeah. but men's it's uh, first and second Bundesliga. You need to have a level. Now, um, do you have to have it to coach those levels? Yes. Because what happens? All oh, yeah. Other... Yeah. Well, you, then you need to hire someone that sits on the bench together with you for at least three quarters of the games that has it. Oh, so, so it's someone on the bench has to have it. Yeah. Otherwise you get fined. Ah, okay, okay. Because I was thinking, I'm like, probably not all the first Bundesliga coaches have it. They and have like when they hire the uh, ex-professional handball players. Oh, they well, they they have a they have a you can get the B level very like they have a, a short B level education for those like it's called ex pro player B license, and then you can get into the A level, and when you are into the A level, you're allowed to coach when you while you're doing it, but you have to do it then, you know, you have oh, okay, to, okay, okay. you have to be on the program and you have to be on the education. And above all that, we still have the EHF master coach. And um, actually you don't, well, you need it now. They, they changed that. You need it now to be in champions league. And I think in EHF league, I think you need to have it. Um, that's what I heard. I'm not coaching there. So, so um, I was actually thinking not for fun, but to, like there's not a lot of education. I sometimes try to go to Denmark to, to see something new. I have the Danish uh, coaching education, yeah. um, the, the diploma coach, is it called? And which is like the A-level in Germany. Um, I, I did it in Denmark while I was there. So I'm, I'm trying sometimes to learn new stuff and I found out probably it's the EHF master coach now. So if it happens next year in Germany due to COVID, I don't know if there's going to be a new course, but I already talked to the people in the Federation that if there's going to be a coach, I'm probably going to do it just to, just to get the course in and see something new and hear something new. Uh, last question. I don't, I don't know if this will probably be pretty hard for you to answer. But if you can go back into your whole coaching career, is there one game that stands out that re that is like your 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 favorite game? The way you coach the game, the win. Is there one game that you will always remember? I would say they're they're kind of two, okay. and maybe it's more. 
it's more the seasons behind it and the whole experience. The one is, is when we were with uh, Bad Neustadt in, in uh, German third league and we were battling for going up second to second Bundesliga and we were uh, uh, one or two points behind the leading team, and, but the leading team still had to play the team in first league on the last day. But we had an away game and we were playing that away game, which was hard because that team was battling against going down and it was a very small hall and we somehow made it to win there. And it was like, and we got the results from the other game. And while we were always leading with four or five games all the time, like I, I had told everybody not, not to say a word to my team, like how the result in the other hall was because I wanted them to win first and then we can care. But we had like a hundred fans with us and they were going crazy all the time because the other game was like 15 minutes behind. And then there at halftime, the other team like was leading. So we would be going up in that situation. So you could like, you try to coach and keep your team calm. Well, you can't because everybody's excited from your fans. So you know that you see them on the phone the whole time and texting and you know, like, Oh my God, we're going up to second Bundesliga probably. And that was a pretty exciting moment. And it was a pretty exciting party. Uh, but the pure moment you have to cool down your Bosnian national players standing next to you on the bench. They're like, sit down. It's still 10 minutes here and it's still 20 minutes over there. You know, like, like let's celebrate when it's all done, you know? And he's like, yeah, okay. And then he, then he goes excited again, you know, he just said like there, oh, okay, give it up, you know, like right. just try to win this game. That was one. And the other one was we were pretty um, with, um, with, um, with Göppingen. We were pretty, like we were not the, we were underdog of making the first Bundesliga. And then the girls went undefeated through the playoffs and they had this very tremendous game um, in Viper, in, uh, not in Viper, where was that? It was somewhere far out in the, on the countryside. Oh, in Viban, yeah. And they had this great game in Viban where they just beat one of the really good teams and they were just so much better. And it was, it was an amazing moment when sometimes these little puzzle pieces fall all together and you're just standing out there like, hey, doing really well. And it was, there was one game before which was even more amazing because we just won the, that was in the semifinals in Bayer Oede. We won at home by two goals and everybody was saying like, oh my God, two, two goals, that's not enough for, for beating them on the road. Two goals is not enough. And we were going in there with that mindset like, it's another 60 minutes. We've won on the road against a lot of teams. Let's just do it. We, we felt actually pretty fine. And then we were going out there and they didn't tell us that there was a light and laser show 18 minutes before the game. <laughs> so we were just going to warm us up and they were just like, we were warming up for 10 minutes and they just turning off the lights. So we were just super angry. And of course we were protesting against it and all those things. And it made the girls just so angry. Like I've never seen so angry girls and they just went out there and they were leading eight one after 10 minutes because they were just so angry. And we just ran over them. And it was one of these moments where you're just sitting there like, you're like, I need to see that on video again. Did that really happen out here? Like, you know, like, like they're trying to play really bad on us. They're putting the lights off. We can't warm up properly. Our goalkeepers had no shot and my goalkeeper saving everything just because he's so angry. You see that warming up is kind of overrated at this, at this stage. It's more about your mental state of health, you know? Well, um, well, thank you for doing this, Olaf. Uh, I mean, I consider you one of my closest friends from the time that we started handball. I've learned a lot from you. Uh, the kids that we also learned go, a lot. We also learned a lot from you. Don't mm -hmm. don't don't make it so one sided. Uh, the kids that go there, we always have a tremendous time. It's sad because of COVID that we couldn't go this summer, but hopefully all works out. And we uh, our plan is to go in uh, in November. So hopefully things are okay by then, and we can send a group of kids there at that time. We hope so yeah. soon. We hope to see you soon yeah. again. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, obviously, we'll be talking very soon. Bye. Bye.